a sea lion is one, this elephant seal is two, and so is this walrus. They're all pinnipeds. The pinniped family is made up of mammals with flippers, but not all pinnipeds are alike. Sea lions have external ears. Walruses have about 450 whiskers, and seals can't rotate their flippers to walk on land. Right, Wally? Thank you. <laughs> Loss of habitat has made it necessary for animals to adapt to man's environment in order to survive. This situation is exemplified by Pier 39 in San Francisco Harbor. At Marine World Africa USA's Sea Lion Stadium in Vallejo, California, the public is both educated and entertained by the colorful story of Pier 39's winged and wet inhabitants. There was no lack of close encounters with these charming marine mammals during my visit. And somehow, it always seemed to be time for play. That's a good boy. What? Good boy, so. Wow. I've, I've always wondered what makes a sea lion go so fast in the water. And with me is Bucko and Sultan from Marine World Africa USA. Now, how can a big old thing like this go so fast? Big old thing like this? I, I don't think you appreciate me calling you that. Aren't you a big old thing here? <laughs> well, look at, first of all, the adaptation right here. Look at these giant flippers. Wow. wow. Imagine one must take to propel something like this through the water. Now, he's probably close to about 600 pounds. Well, why, Bucko, do they refer to this as a pinniped? Actually, the translation for pinniped is winged feet or feather foot, Jack. Oh, a wing almost looks like, like a wing, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, that wasn't very nice of you, Sultan. And of course, they use these mighty fine teeth uh, for grasping fish and prey. They don't chew their smells. food. Yeah. Oh, yeah. By the fish, I'd bet, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, they use their their teeth for grasping. They don't they notice here. Look, that swallows it right right down. They don't chew oh, their food. If they have larger prey items, they'll do is they'll grab that fish, shake it into smaller chunks, and then swallow those chunks. So, you didn't chew it all, just no, jump yeah, it right, right down. Right down. Sure. There's one more. Yeah. There's one more uh -huh. big fish. Uh huh. I'm cool. sure you'd like a few more. Yeah. yeah. Sure. I see they've got tiny ears. They don't hear very well. Actually, they heal quite well. You might remember the water, that sound travels about twice as fast underwater than it does on land, so they don't really need those sound-catching uh, pinna that the terrestrial animals had. Now, can we see him swim? Well, we'll put him in the water. We'll see. You going to go for a swim for us, huh? All right, take a break. Go on, take a swim. You go. There we go. <laughs> well, it looks like a torpedo. They use their front flippers for propulsion and usually the hind flippers for steering. For power. Yeah, for power, power and, and steering. steering. That's right. Oh, they're certainly designed to streamline for swimming. You might notice of the torpedo shape of the animals. Designed for cutting through those, those water with the huh. least amount of effort. Come on, Rachel. Come on, Wilbur. Good girl. Wilbur, come. This is a seal? This is a seal. This is a Pacific Harbor seal, little Rachel. Wilbur, you want to join us? There he is. This is little Wilbur also. <laughs> Wilbur's the male over here. And the little female Rachel is going to take her fish and play with it in the water. Now, their, their flippers look real teeny. Yeah. Well, again, this is the distance between the seal and the sea lion. Right. All right. Look at the small fl flippers that the seal has right here. You okay. can hardly see them. That's yeah, right. And they use the hind flippers for swimming, propulsion. The front flippers are used for steering. Direct opposite of the right. sea lion. Right. And the other thing here, also the ears. Now, you got a Oh, yeah, they got look. ears. See those? No ears. Just two holes up there, just the holes in the side of their head. So the pinnipeds are the seals, the sea lions, and the walrus. And the walrus, right. right. These are, are the, uh, the, the pinniped family. Is that right, Wilbur? Yep, 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 yep. Want to wave? Want to wave? Want to wave for us? Yeah. Oh, you... 
This is trying to wave in the water. That's what happens when you wave in the water. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> Rachel, come on up here. Rachel, come up here and wave. Come Don't on wave up. out there and get me all come wet. Come on up here. All right, come on, Rachel. There we go. Here we go. And they are very good friends, aren't they? Give them a kiss. Hold oh. it. There you go. Now, I've always considered myself a seafaring man. But unfortunately, I can't say that was the case on this next little voyage. This thing doesn't go over, you don't think it will? No. Can you swim? <laughs> now, why is it that all the pinnipeds get around the piers in San Francisco? What, what makes them go down there? Well, that's their natural habitat, the bay. They've been there first, obviously. As you can see, they enjoy climbing on the boats also, too. <laughs> so they really also have all this food abundance down there in the pier area. Uh, it's illegal now to feed these animals. Um, Whoa! And he is fed here. Whoa! <laughs> Wilbur, wow, he's pretty Wilbur. voracious. Wilbur. <laughs> Wilbur, thing ain't big enough for you and me and Bucko. Whoa! Okay, Bye. thank you. I think you're trying to dunk us, Wilbur. Yeah, I know he is. <laughs> I'm not thinking. I know Wilbur's trying to dunk us. Wait, Wilbur, wait a minute. Can't get to the pier with you in here. Wilbur! <laughs> I'm never going to make it. Go on. Big boat. <laughs> It isn't Coast Guard approved for only old fat All right, you'll break it on. I need to know where Pier 39 is. I didn't ask you to come pier in the Pier 39, boat. let's go. We're on our way to the pier. Goodbye. Here we go. Me uh, Jackson. You crew. To see what he could see. <laughs> and all that he could see was the sea, was the sea, was the sea. This is Captain Jack. Captain Jack. Go ahead. <laughs> all aboard. And I was off on an adventure with Captain Dave Stuhlbarg of the Red and White Fleet. Where's the steering wheel? Well, that's this. Well, I still call this the wheelhouse, even though we don't have a wheel anymore. They have this a little thing here is only a guide. That's all there is. Just go like this. Yeah. Nice slow turn. What about that sailboat right there? Well, don't hit him, Jack. We better do something because we're on a collision course. Yeah, it looks like we're going to pass pretty close. Ten rudder right. <laughs> Lord, yeah, you're doing great now. <laughs> We missed him. Can you imagine me driving a boat in San Francisco Bay? That's what I'm doing, right? You're doing it. You're in command. He what about sea back. lines? You see sea lines? Tons of them. Yeah, in fact, right Tons now, they have taken over the dock at Pier 39. No kidding. Yeah. When we pull in, you'll be able to look over and see the docks covered with sea lions. Cool. That's what I want to see. Yeah, that's where they live. <sighs> Golly! Look at they taking over. Good night. Well, the boats can't go in there anymore, can they? Nope, it? nope, the boats don't go in anymore. It's a riot. Now, why do they stay there? Well, well there's herring along this point, so the food is here. They got it made, don't they? Yeah. They brought in extra floats for them, and now they take care of them. <laughs> Man and beast getting alone together, right? Yeah, symbiotic relationship. Sea lion dance. We were supposed to meet Ann Maurer, director of interpretive programs from Sausalito, California's Marine Mammal Center. It wasn't too difficult to find Ann in the sea lions because all you had to do was follow the sounds. And before you knew it, you were face to face with one of the most amazing sights I have ever seen. Now, Ann, what happened to all the boats out here? Well, the boats are no longer here. The sea lions have taken over the docks. Having them this close to people on a man-made structure and not being at all, for the most part, harassed is really amazing. So what do you think they like about this, these beautiful sunny boat decks? It is beautiful and sunny here. Um, the docks are very easy for them to get on, if you can imagine this compared to a rock. There are not predators of right. California sea lions in the bay. They're easy access to their food source. What's one of the biggest problems sea lions are facing? We get, I just happen to have in my pocket, but we get a lot of animals that are entangled with, with these packing straps. Imagine an animal without hands that can take this off of them. More and more we're seeing our own trash yeah. is, is harming these animals. Now that right down there looks like he's got a big hole in his neck. What he's got around his neck is actually a piece of fishing line. Oh. And it's cutting into his neck, and as he gets bigger, it'll cut deeper and deeper. If it doesn't break, I mean, for all intents and purposes, it could cut his trachea, and he'll die. So you're going to try and get that off? The Marine Mammal Center, which specializes in rescuing and rehabilitating pinnipeds, goes all over California to rescue, but a dock situation is one of the most difficult places to rescue. Oh. With this amount of animals on the dock, with the docks being as slippery as they are, it's a very dangerous rescue. And even if you approach them at any angle, all of them will wake up 
and they'll start to clear the docks. Look at that. Oh. Yeah, it's interesting here to, to watch the California sea lions out here. People come from all over and wonder why are they doing things they're doing out there. They're out there scratching, they're out there rubbing, they're laying on each other. You'll even see animals walking over each other. California sea lions are very social. They like to be close to each other, and they don't usually mind another guy walking over them, um, but they might put their head up in protest. They're not disturbed by us, we're not disturbed by them, and it is one of the best viewing spots you'll ever have. I went down for a closer look at these gregarious creatures with Larry Goodson, who works with Pier 39's Harbor Patrol. Now, you're in charge of these docks here? Yes, in the sense that uh, I can go on and fix them when they damage them. But other than that, the sea lions are definitely in charge. I mean, you, that must be a pretty big honor. I mean, you're in charge of a sea lion dock. <laughs> it's the only one in the world. Well, it may be an honor to some people, but when you're uh, ankle deep in some of the uh, problems that occur out here, it's not as much of an honor as you'd think. <laughs> How many are out here right now? 200, 300? I think there's about three, 325 or so. We've had up to 600 at one time. 600? 600. They stack up like cordwood. <laughs> hey, look at this. I'm just going on and on and on. I love to see them. In the mornings especially, they're, they're romping around, fighting each other. They, they've just been in from fishing, and they're full of food and full of good love and fun. <laughs> I mean, what do they do besides sit here and sleep all day? <laughs> Swim and honk? Swim and honk. A sea lion schedule is pretty much the best you can imagine. I think, I think humans often aspire to laying around on docks all day, and all they do oh, yeah. is fish and eat in the mornings and at night, and otherwise it's Sun City. long to figure out why these immense sea mammals are called elephant seals. I'm here with Kevin Williams, park ranger at Onion Wave Old State Park about 50 miles south of San Francisco. And this is where elephant seals come to breed and have babies. Now, Kevin, how many of them come here every year? Usually in the winter we get about 3,800 animals here. That's about the peak number. The elephant seals have been coming onto the beaches here since the 60s. Why is it these elephant seals have picked this place to come back to? Probably because it's a safe place, it's quiet, there aren't a lot of people coming through here, there's not motorcycles or cars, and I, that's probably the biggest reason is for the safety that they get here. Because it's a state reserve, they're protected, and, and they really breed mostly in, in very isolated areas. Oh, look at that people up here on the hill. These are visitors that have come to look at the, so, look so at the, the nursery. They all just can't, they have to come down in a group? Yeah, they're going to come with a guide. Because there are so many animals out here, one of our jobs here as, as park rangers is to try to protect the animals here from indiscriminate intrusion by people. You know, right. We don't want people just to walk up and frighten the animals. Right. And uh, because they're so big, we don't want people getting hurt. Right. Now, how many kids a year come to this park? We have about 120 a day coming through, th through here for the three-month period. And then in the spring and uh, fall, they also bring their classes out here. That's great. Well, Bill, this is uh, Jack Hanna. I'd like to introduce you. you. My pleasure, nice sir. See you. This is a group of uh, Westlake uh, School, and they're pretty smart. Now, you're, you're a volunteer here? Yes, sir, I am. Bill, what will you tell the kids? What I like to talk about is, is actually the group as it stands right now. And what we're looking at is a harem. Can everybody see right over here? You see the elephant seal? You call him an alpha bull. He is the bull that is the biggest, the strongest, the meanest, bull right there and the cunningest bull in that area and what he's done in the last month or so is run all of the other bulls off so that all of the girls come in all of the females and come in and hang around him it's kind of a good place to be right in the middle where all the girls are <laughs> then look around the outside we see all the way around on the outside you see we see some other bulls well some of those we call beta bulls they're pretty strong and they're pretty healthy but they're not as big or as strong as that alpha bull in the middle. And what they're going to do is they're going to hang around and hope, hope that they're going to get a girlfriend. So is this a good group? Excellent group. What amazes you about this creature? I, I like their noses. You like their noses? <laughs> <laughs> they do have funny noses, don't they? What do you like the most? They're really big. <laughs> and fat. <laughs> and fat? Yeah. Well, I like the pups. They're, they're really... They're really cute. Well, that one in the water was going, ah, ah! <laughs> Are you a lot of you going to come back? <coughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I appreciate it. I don't want to keep them from your tour. 
My pleasure, sir. See y'all later. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. 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 Thank you. See you later. <laughs> Is that just their purpose, to sit here and lay around and breed these bulls? Right now, that's why they're here, and to try to breed with as many females as they can. An alpha bull, he, may, he might mate over the season with, you know, 50 or 60 females. Wow. Now, what's it mean, like, when that's big one here, he goes like this? He's, he's checking things out, and he's, he's, what he's doing is looking around and seeing who's a threat to him and who he's going to maybe challenge. Oh, see, so he... Uh, so he lifts his neck he's up. He's lifting his neck up and he's looking around, and that's also a threat. You can see this one that's kind of responding by moving away a little bit from right. him. It's a game of strategy, and you try to bluff and frighten away other show males. How big you show are. how big you are. And the way you do that is by raising your head up in the air. Now, they're up on the beach right now. Will they go back in the water? No, they'll stay here because for a male, once you've staked your, uh, your claim yeah. to an area with females, you try to protect that because if they leave, then they have to come back and, and pick their way back up the, the ladder through fighting. So that old male is going to sit there and try and breed and not eat dinner or anything for four or five weeks? He's got to go. He'll go actually uh, almost three months without eating. Three months? Three months. What they do is they, have kids. they store it up and they get fat. And so that three months that they're here, they're on a wow. crash diet, and they lose almost half their body weight during that time that they're wow. here. So it's, you slowly see them deflating, and they get skinnier and skinnier. By the time they're ready to leave, though, they're pretty tired. They've been running around mating and fighting, and uh, they're just pooped. Hey, look at the size of that thing. He's actually a small elephant seal. He's a younger male. One of the reasons he's up here in the dunes, these are all kind of the losers. And uh, they're much too small to be close to the females where most of the mating and whatnot takes place. And so these guys have been driven up here by the bigger males. That's a loser? This is a loser, a very big loser. If you look real closely at his back, you'll see a lot of teeth marks yeah. and things from the fighting that's happened. Somebody's even gotten him on his tail as he's been trying to get away. They just like to be in freshwater puddles? Just to stay cool, mostly. It's just, uh, you have to remember they have such a thick layer of fat on their bodies that it doesn't take long to get heated up. It's going to be hard to get down to the beach today because there's so many seals. It's like a minefield, but uh, <laughs> let's try this way and see if we can get our way down. Boy, Kevin, I can't believe that I've experienced these elephant seals right here in California and the United States. You know, it's, it's amazing. It is very amazing. About six million people live within an hour drive of this park. In the San Francisco Bay Area and beyond, there's just a lot of people living over here, and yet you can see something as beautiful as oh. this. Oceans are the last great frontier on the planet. Everywhere we look, we discover new forms of life and new keys to understanding the environment. This is Monterey Bay in California, one of the richest and most varied marine environments in the world. Within the bay, a submarine canyon the size of the Grand Canyon in Arizona plunges to depths of over 10,000 feet. Nutrients from this deep chasm well up on the currents to feed the abundant plant and animal life above. The waters of this rich bay flow into this place, the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Some of the sea life has come in on its own with the water, and now flourishes inside. A series of windows inside offers a visitor views of the many distinct communities of life of Monterey Bay. Wow. Whoa, there it comes, yeah! <laughs> wow, look at this crab. Man, alive. He's got slime, he's got things all over him. Are you supposed to be doing that? I don't know anything about... You're Betty White, aren't you? You're Jack Hanna, aren't you? Yeah, but I don't know anything about crabs, do you? What is this? That's a, a decorator crab. And the only oh, thing wow. you have to watch with him are these two little pinchers back here. I'll be. But you know why he's called a decorator crab? No. Well, he'll tear off a piece of kelp and chew them for a while, and then people think he's scratching his back. He's putting the kelp up there. You'll see them all decorated pretty soon. It's very dressy. Now, how do you know so much about these animals? Oh, I, I was a crab once myself. No, <laughs> no, they've always been an endless source of fascination. But then when, when he's in the water and he's all decorated like that, it looks like a piece of foliage to his prey. Does he get along with all these other in here? Everybody seems to get along beautifully in here. 
Sea star, you think of a starfish as a starfish as a starfish, right? Look at the variety wow. of these. Golly, look at this. These are the bat stars, these guys. Golly, day. And look at the colors, honey. They come in every conceivable See, I've, color. Only, I've only seen them in this color here. Look, look at this red guy. Look at him. Oh. Is he not gorgeous? Now, these are all the five-pointed stars. But just to keep everybody happy, look at this fellow. This is a six-pointed star. Good night. And you know how a starfish feeds? I find that fascinating. He doesn't reach out for food, like, like you know, go and get the food. He has a... A stomach that comes out here and just assimilates the food right into the stomach and then back in it goes. He, he eliminates the middleman completely. <laughs> Isn't it something? Here's a beautiful guy. This one looks like a rock. Wouldn't you swear this was just a just a plain old rock? Here. Golly. Now he's got his shell under that. Feels like Play-Doh. Or... It does, but then when you turn him over, he's a gumboot kite. And he's got this this foot. That's his oh. foot. And along in here are his gills. And he's so flexible that he can he can curl around a rock or whatever. So that not only does it help him disguise himself, but it also keeps him from being pulled out with a strong. You'd never curve. know that was a living creature. Never. Just another pretty face. Golly, <laughs> day. When you see all these kids here, yeah. <laughs> they are getting an opportunity to see things that we never did. I mean, when they see these things, they're not—they're going to be a lot more respectful of the ocean when they go back out, having having held one of these guys in their hand. This is the kelp forest exhibit. At 28 feet, this is the tallest aquarium exhibit in the world the first to recreate a living kelp environment. The kelp forest, like all the exhibits here, represent a particular habitat of Monterey Bay. The giant kelp needs the constant back and forth flow of seawater to live. Special surge pumps had to be engineered to recreate the natural motion of the sea. The beautiful underwater kelp forest is a sight usually only seen by divers. Divers enter this tank too to feed the fish and answer questions of visitors. Dan, this is a huge tank. Just how big is this tank? Oh, it's uh, it's quite big. It it holds about three hundred thousand gallons. Three hundred thousand of water, see, of seawater. Well, what's that thing there? What's that thing? Right here in front of you, right in front of your head. Look up, right there. That. That's a. Looks like an eel. Yeah, I don't know the name of that fish. It's kind of a rare one. It lives in the kelp. In yeah, the it kelp looks like a lake. kelp fish. Exactly. It, it um, the way that it just, uh, hides is by hiding in the kelp leaf. Looks just like the kelp. A lot of fish have good camouflage, it looks like. Extremely, yes. That's, uh, that's how they survive. Animals that look like plants? I wanted to find out more about that. I found Mark Ferguson feeding some strange food to some even stranger animals. Mark, I notice when I go to the ocean, there's all kinds of little creatures on the floor. Are these things alive? Most of them are. There's a mixture of plants and animals, but a lot of things you might think are plants are really animals, like the white plumos anemone in back of me. Jack, these anemones can live to perhaps over 100 years. 100 years? Yes. They look so fragile, though. They are mainly made out of water. There's very little substance to them. One interesting aspect of the Anemones is that they can sometimes shrink down to almost nothing. Some of the small white discs in back of me are the same animals that you see fully extended. So those little white blobs there on that rock are those big anemones? Those could be the same size maybe an hour from now if they decide to open. And what, what about a, um, look like a crab or look like a, look weird hanging on top of this plant? That might have been the uh, basket star. It's a relative of the starfish, but instead of just having five arms, it has maybe hundreds. When an animal will touch one of these tendrils, the tendrils will ball up around it and surround the, the animal, and then gradually it will work its way to the mouth underneath the animal. When I was a kid, I was always afraid of one animal, the octopus. I know now that it was probably a wrong idea, but I thought I'd find out for sure at the aquarium. 
the Monterey Bay Aquarium has the giant Pacific octopus, the largest octopus species in the world. Tim, this thing looks real, like, vicious. Can you touch him? Oh, sure, you can touch him. No, you go touch him first. Yeah. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Here we go. They're actually Golly. pretty gentle and docile. Wow. Just how smart is an octopus? Very smart. Uh, they're thought to be one of the smartest invertebrates really? alive today. Huh. Yes. Well, they got a big brain? Uh, they're not a real big brain, but they're able to uh, process information visually and tactily also. Now, a minute ago, I saw this uh, octopus changing colors. Was I seeing things? No, you weren't. Um, that's its largest organ is its skin, and within its skin is uh, chromatophores. And chromatophores are little sacs with ink in it, and they're able to contract those or expand them, and that changes its color. Well, look at that. He's bright red now. It can change color within a second. And that's a means of defense? To camouflage, it's also uh, used in mating. With all those arms, a female couldn't get away, could she? No, <laughs> no, but anything that moves in front of them, uh, they consider food, so they do use their color to help the female identify them. Boy, do you think I could ever feed one of these? You can give it a try. There's some food there. Looks like we're feeding it its cousin to it. <laughs> yeah, it is its cousin, <laughs> but it does eat its cousin. Oh. Come here, baby. Come here. Come here. Oh, I love this octopus. I wish I could take him home. Since 1984, the Monterey Bay Aquarium has been a rescue center for abandoned or orphaned sea otter pups. Sea otters were once plentiful along the coast of California, but heavy hunting for their fur brought them near extinction. Today, their numbers have begun to come back but every otter pup is precious. Four of the early successes of the program are now residents of the aquarium, every day delighting visitors with their play. They are extremely playful. The ice cubes that were fed on the exhibit are just freshwater ice cubes, and our four resident otters really like them. It's just something fun to them. A baby sea otter is almost completely helpless. The first problem the aquarium had to solve was how to wean a sea otter pup and keep it alive in captivity. The second, much more difficult problem was how to raise the otter so that it could be returned to the wild. In nature, the baby otter depends on its mother for everything, nutrition, protection, and learning the skills it'll need to survive. If it's to survive in the wild, it needs to know basic skills, things like cracking open shells to get at food. So otter care specialists began acting as surrogate mothers for the orphaned pups. Bonding and trust were developed. The goal was the release of these otters back into the bay, and the program has been remarkably successful. I can't. Will she eat that? Oh yeah. Then oh you'll my see gosh. Her eat the next, um, when one of the released five, otters suddenly oh. swam into the bay, Julie and I hurried over to see it. On the rock work. Yeah. That oh. is a big one. She scored. She Hope beauty. it doesn't bite her. No, it won't. You watch it, she'll bang it on the rock work at some point, I bet. Yeah. Damn, a lot. You really scored. That is huge crab. <laughs> I mean, look at the pinchers on it. Now, this one was raised here? This. Yeah, April came in in, of, uh, let's see, 1989, and we released her in 90. And she, again, she was an orphan pup that washed up on the beach. And the, we spent many days swimming with her in the tide pool in the ocean as part of her training. But we actually spent 42 days round the clock out here. The volunteers and staff slept on this rock here Shoot. with her. 
You released her in this pool here. Yeah. Well, see, April, I can't remember if we released her right here in the tide pool. I think we, we no, we released her right over here on the backside of the aquarium at yeah. Hopkins Beach. And here it is, you know, basically a year later. Yeah. She has been in this tide pool every day. Every day. Since her release. And she finds her own food. Yes. The first month and a half, right, we, yeah. we did supplement her. One day, we just noticed that she was going out and foraging on her own, so we cut the food out and realized she could take care of herself. <laughs> What a, what a story, so. that's neat. I mean, just for me to stand here as a visitor to Monterey Bay Aquarium and be able to see a sea otter in the wild and go back inside and see one in a tank, there's no place in the world you could do that, yeah. except right here. Exactly. These are called moon jellyfish. They're not really fish at all. They're jellies and they're related to corals and sea anemones. They have stinging cells as sea anemones and corals do. And you can see a similarity in appearance in that they're symmetrical in a circular sense and they have a mouth in the center of a ring of tentacles. And the main difference is that these are able to move around and swim around whereas anemones are attached the other way around on the surface of the corals or rocks. It's a very simple kind of jet propulsion. They're pushing water away from them. They have a muscle system that allows the edge of their belt to contract, so they can push the water back and swim forward. They don't have a real brain. They have a nerve net, a very simple kind of nervous system, and they can sense light and dark, and they can tell up from down. These moon jellies are found right out here, right off the aquarium in Monterey Bay, and they're also found all over the world. These could be classified as predators. You can always tell a hungry jellyfish by looking at its tentacles. When they're very fine and stretched out very far, it means they're searching for food as they're swimming around. You can see a, a cloverleaf pattern on the back of the animal for ring-like structures, and that's where the food is eventually digested and passed on to the rest of the body. One of my favorite things about about this exhibit is standing behind people as they're watching and listening to the comments that they make. And some of the best things I've heard include um, people referring to them as lampshades or silent fireworks as they pulsate, as they swim, as they stretch their tentacles out. They, they do look like silent explosions. And a lot of people refer to them as a water ballet. They like the beautiful dance that they do as they swim. There have been some great science fiction movies where they use jellyfish-like creatures as aliens. They seem very alien in appearance. Look at that. He's right below us. Golly. You're not going to get any better look at an otter than look that. Look at that. Oh, is You've got to be so proud to be working with the aquarium. Oh, I'm so proud of this aquarium. I just, they've done such a magnificent job. It's so hard because you always want to reach out and touch them, don't you? Oh, <laughs> do you? Do you oh. know the feeling of anybody Oh, does, I know. Jack. It's just terrible. It's like, I can't stand it here. Oh. I wonder what happened to us if we jumped in the water, Betty. Just slip in quietly. I bet nobody would notice it around here, do you think? Okay. <laughs> when I first started coming up here as a kid, I remember going over to Point Lobo State Park and the ranger driving through in his truck saying, sea otter, sea otter, because <laughs> they, they never saw them. And, huh. and uh, the rangers even knew how rare they were, so he pointed them out to us. Well, now you can go over to Lobos and see otters, wild otters, anytime you want. So they didn't come back then? So they've uh, managed to bring them back. It's turned it around. Come on, baby. Come on. I mean, you, know, you could literally sit here for hours and watch these. The Monterey Bay Aquarium sits on a section of Monterey called Cannery Row, made famous in part by the novels of John Steinbeck. In those novels, Steinbeck's central character, Doc, was based on a real-life marine biologist named Ed Ricketts, 
who lived and worked here in the 1930s and 40s. His ideas inspired a generation of biologists and environmentalists. What Ricketts concluded as he studied the life of the bay was that no living thing could be understood in isolation. That in order to understand something, you have to understand how it lives. And that means understanding a complex web of interaction and interdependency. This idea that the animals and plants of the earth all interrelate is such an important one for our time. What we do to one species may affect all the others. Anheuser-Busch theme parks conservation moment. The pledge made real. Penguins also have blubber. So we're going to have our slider flippers right in through there. At SeaWorld, we have an education program that I feel is very important. Not only do we teach the students about the animals that live in the ocean, but we also teach the students about the consequences that they can have on those animals. Does anybody know what this is? Fishing line. This is a discarded fishing line. I'm going to pass this around. And how do you think a penguin could get hurt by this fishing line? Because it might get caught on it when it comes up for air. Right. It might get caught in this, and that could keep the penguin underneath the water. One of the things that we try to teach the, the students is that a uh, balloon or trash that gets in the water can move around through the ocean currents and can actually, over years, wind up in different lands, including the Antarctic. Could this balloon wind up in Antarctica? Yes. It's possible. The students that are coming through the education program that we're reaching nowadays are much better educated about the consequences they have on the environment. The words recycling and reusing and reducing are in their vocabulary much more so than when I was growing up. I think that the fact that the students know more about recycling is going to have a very good effect on the environment. By learning about these things at a very early age, they can then pass that on as they grow older, when they begin to vote, when they have more of a consequence on the environment. And we try to teach all age groups how their actions by throwing trash on the ground, how it can affect animals all over the world. Anheuser-Busch Theme Parks Conservation Moment. The pledge made real.